In this video, I'm going to be talking about my absolute favorite selector in CSS. And I know it might seem a little bit strange to have a favorite selector, but this one lets us do some really cool things. And um, there's a lot of really good use cases for it, really. Some of them are when you're dealing with templates where you can't actually access the HTML, so you can't add classes or do other stuff. So it opens up some cool avenues there. Um, and some of it's just to write a lot less code. So in this video, we're going to be looking at what that combinator is and how we can use it in your websites. Hi there, my name is Kevin. Welcome to my channel where we learn how to make the web and how to make it look good while we're at it with weekly tips, tricks, and tutorials. Been on a little bit of a break, but we are back and we're looking at my absolute favorite CSS selector. So it is the adjacent sibling selector. And one of the reasons I like this so much is just the, the powers that we have with this and how we can write a lot less CSS uh, than we might otherwise have to do. Um, so for this, what we're going to do is look at a really simple example. And then after that, we're going to jump into a bit more of a practical one where I'm going to pull something from my own website and we'll look at different ways we can use it on a, you know, something that would be in the real world as opposed to one of those, you know, this, the, the first thing we'll be looking at. But I think the first thing will solidify how it's working before we look at um, actually putting it into practice. So let's go and take a look. And if we look here uh, at my code, this is in VS Code and I do have live server running. So uh, if I hit save, you'll see things update right away. And here is my HTML, really, really nice and basic. And you can see, I just have a bunch of divs here. And so each one of these is example, and then I've numbered them. I don't even know if I'll need the numbers. Or actually, yeah, we'll probably look at the numbers a little bit. But here we have my example. And then my adjacent sibling selector. So what, what does that even look like, right? Um, so if I do a dot example, and then plus dot example, it look, might look a little strange right now. But this is saying um, it's looking for adjacent siblings. So what is an adjacent sibling? It's a, it's, let's go back to my HTML because it's really, and it's this one right here. It's the really, um, it's looking at the markup that you have here. So it's saying, does this one have an, it's, when it says adjacent, it means come before it. <laughs> so it's going, does this one here have an example before it? Nope. Does this one have one before it? Yep. Does this one? Yes. Does this one? Yes. Does this one? Yes. So uh, if we look here, example plus example, and I give this a background of red, and I hit save, all of them change except for the first one. And you know, doesn't look super amazing yet, but it's kind of interesting that we can do that, right? So it's saying that every single one of these has an adjacent sibling or a sibling before it that is example. And I could even simplify this; it doesn't have to be the same. I could say a div which one of these has a div before it. And in this case, they all do except for the first one at the top because the first one, uh, if we go back to this, this one doesn't have a div before it, it has the body tag before it. So it doesn't actually end up getting selected. If I were to add another div here, I'll just make it a blank div with nothing in it. Now they're all going to be red because now this has a div that's coming before it. So it's saying, what is the thing that comes before my example, is it a div? Yes, we can switch it to red. What if I just put the number three here? Whoops, class of three. So if I have an example that before it has a class of three, so let's go and look, and actually let's clear this all out. So we'll go back to teal for everything. And let's go take a look here. So I have my three here. So I have my three that's looking for an adjacent. So three would be my middle one. So if we come back, I'm saying, I'm looking for an example that has three before it. So that means we're hopefully targeting the fourth one right here. Let's hit save. And there we go. We've targeted the fourth one because we have my example. It has a class of three before it. And that means it's going to change. Um, now this, you, there's better ways of doing something like that. You don't want to actually give your class names one, two, three, four, five. I just wanted a quick example of how this is working a little bit. Um, I'd probably use a, a different selector for that one. Um, you know, nth of nth child or nth of type. Uh, to do something a little bit like that. Um, but, you know, you might be going, okay, then in theory, you understand how it's working, but I think we want to see it in a bit more of a practical manner, right? Because it's a little bit boring looking at it like that. Um, so let's go and take a look at it. Oh, it says a code pen because I always write these in code pen first and then I bring the code in and I forgot to change the title of both of these. So it's not in code pen, but it says a code pen. Um, and this is something I pulled out of my own site. Now I took the navigation off, I took the footer off and all of that other stuff. Um, but I, what I wanted to do here is look at something that's a bit more 
production level, I guess, since you know, my site is in production, um, and take a look at it. And with a few caveats, because this was done with grid, so there's some double spacing that's coming in here without collapsing margins, um, and a little bit of other stuff. But I want to take a look at this. There's all this extra spacing and stuff. And this is actually something interesting that I've only recently thought about after a lot of people have been asking me about it, to be honest. Um, because you'll notice, uh, by default, our paragraphs, they always have margin top and bottom on them. Um, here I have an H1, there's a big margin top and bottom of it on them um, and stuff like that. And it's kind of annoying when you have the margin top and bottom because you can see here if I'm laying it out on grid, margins that normally collapse in like a regular flow, they don't collapse in grid or in flex. So um, if you know the paragraphs are direct children of a flex parent or a grid parent, um, so they're flex or grid items, they those margins don't collapse anymore and it creates this big double spacing, which is annoying. So you tend to get this thing where you have to turn it off. So you end up with like paragraph is margin zero, uh, zero, one M or something like that. And I've always advocated for that where I'm turning it off and I'm only putting it on the bottom. I think part of this comes from how I'm used to using InDesign because I used to be a print designer and did lots and I always tried to keep as much as possible my margins on the bottom. And every now and then there's a use case, especially for headings and things like that, where you might want a margin top two to increase your spacing. Um, but the more I've thought about it recently, um, I don't mind actually, and you find yourself resetting it a lot. And what actually, what the reason this is coming up is a lot of people would ask me about when you're doing your star selector at the top, and um, usually it's the before and the after, also resetting the margin and the, par um, the padding on everything. And I wasn't a big fan of that because I find you end up having to then reapply it everywhere. But this can actually come in handy. <laughs> um, so let's say you did a star and you actually did your margin zero. So everything gets stuck together, which is crap. And this is where I didn't like this approach because then you have to go through and manually add it back to everything. Ha! Huh. But what if we overwrite it with a star plus star? And let's do this as a margin. And in this case, I'm gonna do it as a margin top. And this is actually, um, it comes. it's called the lobotomized owl. Um, it's Hayden Pickering, I believe, who uh, coined that term and who sort of first dove into this. Uh, I'm gonna link to that description. Um, I'll put a link to his article on it in the description below. This is back in like 2013, 2014 time um, that he came up with this. So this is nothing new, um, but you don't see it as often as you could because of how amazing this is. Um, so here, let's do 1M on the top, 0, 0. So what this is saying is, um, or even we could just say margin top 1M because I've already put all my other ones to 0 here. Um, and if I come and look now, you can see that these are all getting a margin top on them. So it's creating the space between my paragraphs, but my H1 isn't. Why, why isn't my H1 getting any extra margin added to it? That's interesting, right? Think about it for a second, but it's because with this lobotomized owl, our star plus star, the star is selecting everything. So it's saying anything that has something before it. But where this is also interesting is if you have components, so you, here I have a call to action thing to sign up for my newsletter. And because this is the first thing inside that component, it doesn't actually have, uh, so you can see here I have my H3, it's the first thing inside this form. It doesn't have a sibling before it remember this is the adjacent sibling. It's looking for siblings, not for parents. So it's not if there's anything before it. So that means the first element in everything doesn't have a margin top on it, which is really useful because if my H3 here, let's just add it in, by default H3 margin is, let's just say 1M0. Um, so usually it has that margin on the top and the bottom and it creates this extra space inside my component here, which is super annoying. So this sort of eliminates that from happening. And because we're doing it as a margin top, it also prevents the last element, it's, its margin is going on the top, so there's no margin bottom to create some annoying extra space here that you have to get rid of later. Love this so much. <laughs> um, so I think like that, it's actually working pretty well. And one other advantage of this actually is um, because I'm using M's, it's relative to the font size. So here, if I come and look, you can see the space here on top of my H2 is a lot bigger than the one in between my paragraphs. But that's because my H2's font size is bigger, so that space ends up bigger. And that's a good thing. You want something like that because it, in a, the way hierarchy works, you're creating more separation from what's before it. So it really shows you that these belong together. You generally don't want the same space here and here. So I, for me, this is just wonderful that it just automatically does that. And of course, you can adjust this as you go because one thing that you would think 
Um, because this is multiple things in the selector, you would think the specificity, 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 sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's a word I have a little bit of trouble with, but um, you would think that it would be higher, but it's actually zero still because the wild card or, you know, this thing, um, it has zero specificity, 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 whatever. Um, it has, it doesn't have any. So um, yeah, <laughs> this is not going, you could go crazy on this thing technically and then easily overwrite it by just saying, um, H2 margin is 4M and you're going to see, uh, my margin is 4M on that. So it's overwriting what I did here. So super, super convenient. Um, and I really like that. I think it works super well. This is super, super handy. Um, you will notice it did create a little bit when I was coming down here, you might've been going, Kevin, there's a little bit of an issue. I'm not saying it's perfect. <laughs> um, here I have something called my, uh, CTA grid. And you can see it caused an issue because these are siblings, but they're going next to one another. And if you're using Flexbox, you could get the same thing because you'd have three flex children and the second and third one, they end up with a margin on the top, even though it's making columns like this. Um, but what I could do is just say all the direct children of that get a margin top of zero. And if we go and look, it gets rid of that. So that could be one way that you could eliminate things like that. If you're using, um, you know, you could have your row all the direct children in your row have your margin top of zero or something like that. Or if this is like a, a flex, if you have a, a utility class like flex or something like that, um, you could do the exact same thing that I did here to fix that problem. And you wouldn't, you know, it's one little line um, and you may be going, well, it's, it's sort of annoying that I have to overwrite it, but this could save you a ton of lines of CSS. So for something like that, I think it's super interesting and super useful and at least something to definitely think about. Um, the other reason that I like it, this is more of like a general use case if you're writing CSS from scratch. Um, if you have a site that you're working on though, one thing that I really like this for is on my site, I use markup to write my text. So I don't actually have any control on the, the HTML that's being output. So if you come and look here at the top, I always have an H1. I always have a time. So that's my date that's coming in right here. Let's turn word wrap on so we can see it. Um, so you can see there I have my time coming through. And then here I have a paragraph and this paragraph, I can't put a class on it, even if I wanted to, or I guess I could go into my original template, but I don't want that headache. Um, but I do want this paragraph to look a little bit different from all my other paragraphs on my site. I want it to be like my intro paragraph. And so I can do that without having a selector on it and without having to do some weird thing. Um, I can just say that anytime I have a date, and there's a paragraph after my date because I know my date is always right, you know, right before the main article starts. So any paragraph that follows that can have a font size of one point, I don't know, 35 rem. I don't know what I used on my actual site. Um, maybe the line height needs to be a bit bigger, line height of 1.5. And um, in this case, I'm actually using grid. So I could also do a grid column of one over three like that. Um, so it just sticks out and gives me a bit longer of a line since I have a larger font size to play around with it there. Um, and that way, you know, I'm not touching my markup. I don't have to go into my markup to add a class. This might be something if you do a lot of WordPress sites or even doesn't have to be WordPress, but you, any CMS where you don't actually have um, access in the HTML to start adding classes and you don't want to get too complicated with that. We can use these cool tricks with CSS to be able to get into there um, and do these fun things like this. So this is actually what I use on my site to select this one. Um, if you do go and to look at my CSS on my own site, uh, don't, it's really messy. Um, it's, you can see, I have a lot of stuff in here. The site was created on the fly and I've just been adding stuff to it constantly. There's a few conflicts and anyway, it's not pretty, uh, but it works. Um, but, uh, you know, if I were to rewrite it right now, I would probably use something uh, like this. Um, and as I said, this one I'm actually using now. And I think things like this could be really, really useful for grabbing hold um, of the spots you want to grab into and, and link into. If you did like this video and you, you thought that was interesting, everything we did here, I do have another video that goes a lot more in depth into other CSS selectors. And this one is in there as well, but it's all the different combinators we have that a lot of people don't know about. So some of them, it's like the direct child, there's this one, but it, um, it's a lot, lot less in depth on each one, but I sort of cover them all. So if you did like this one and you thought this was interesting and you wanna know more other cool combinators that are out there, I definitely suggest that you go and check out that video. So you can click on the card right now and go and watch that one. 
Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun doing it. I'm happy to be back. A huge thank you to my patrons for helping support me and everything I do here on my channel. You guys are absolutely amazing. If you've made it this far into the video and you've enjoyed what you've listened to and you have not yet subscribed to my channel, please do consider subscribing. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.